Will Zach Eady shock all of his doubters? Will seven foot three Tong T U possibly dominate the WNBA someday? And what were our favorite NBA basketball shoes of 2024 so far? All in this video. Yeah, we got to talk about it because ever since Yao Ming can re retire Chinese basketball been bad for 20 years. Woo! All right, man. Everything Chinese basketball related today, we're going to be covering, guys. I get it. There's actually, uh, we are going to touch on the Japan team, too, coming up. I think oh, there's we got to talk hype. about Caitlin Clark and Bronny, too. Oh, yeah. And also, Jeremy Lin won a championship in the Taiwan League. But anyways, first and foremost, we got to talk about half Chinese uh, half Canadian Zach Eady, who ended up getting drafted number nine to the Memphis Grizzlies, which was actually higher than a lot of people thought he would get drafted at the beginning of the season. But you know, Rashid Wallace did think he was the best player in the draft as well. But anyway, let's take a look at this take, Andrew, uh, from Kristen Peak, Yahoo analyst. The Memphis Grizzlies selected seven foot four, 300 pound Zach Eady with the ninth overall pick in the 2024 NBA draft. This is shocking considered the way that the NBA is turning in terms of value and upside as a hybrid center. He's more of a back to the basket, Shaq, Hakeem Olajuwon and type. And I absolutely have no idea how he's gonna fit in the backcourt with John Morant. He only connected on 8% of his shots off pick and rolls. And defensively, he's a liability in the pick and roll with his limited footwork. There's defensive three seconds. Teams are going to hunt him in the pick and roll. This is one of the shockingest picks I've ever seen in the NBA draft, especially at the top 10. You're looking at what Memphis Grizzlies are leaving on the table with Tristan Da Silva, the 6'9", very versatile forward out of Colorado, even Cody Williams, the younger brother of Jalen Williams and his upside. So to me, this has got to be you know, a terrible pick. I'm giving it a C grade and we'll see if I'm wrong. If I'm wrong, I'm happy to take the L, but this is one of the worst picks I've seen in draft history. Boom, yo, Ooh. she said that this was one of the worst draft picks in the history of the NBA draft. That's crazy. Um, I mean, I would say, obviously his stock went up as the NCAA tournament went on. At the beginning of the season, people didn't know if he was going to go even in the first round. Then he ends up getting drafted ninth. So I do think he got drafted pretty much where he belongs. Like, I don't know if I would have drafted a number one. I would, probably wouldn't have. But I think he deserved to be in top 20 for sure. Right, right, right. By the way, here is Zach's response to people who think his game doesn't fit in the modern NBA. It's a tough thing, obviously, kind of when, when, when people want to uh, take down your game to play a certain way. But at the end of the day, I think uh, like teams are going to value what I do. Like teams are valuing what I do. Uh, it doesn't matter what, what people say. Like Teams put stock into rebounding. Teams put stock into having strength in the paint, like strength in length, um, like all that stuff. People are going to say what they're going to say, but I kind of like I said, like I know who I am. I know what I'm good at. I know what I can, I can stick to. I know what I can kind of hang my hat on. David, because he's even though he has a 6'10 wingspan, he's seven foot three, and apparently his foot speed is actually a lot quicker than people thought. He has they, a 6'10 wingspan or a 7'10? 7 7'10 7 yeah. wingspan, sorry. Um, right, 6'10 would be too short. But uh, he has a long wingspan, and he's fairly quick on his feet, and he was kind of shooting well in the combine. Why do people still doubt his effectiveness in the future of the NBA? Uh, to be honest, and I'm not saying this is the number one reason, part of it is because he's Asian. Oh! No, seriously. I really think so. Uh, because if he was black or white, there's no way they're doubting it that much. However, I do think that he was limited by the system at Purdue. I think his skill set more lines up with like Zubak or like, you know what I mean? Like Andrew Bogut went number one too. Like what? He can't be like Andrew Bogut at least. Right, right, right. I mean, because I, I know that people who know him because he's from Toronto, he used to always practice his shooting, but the sets that Purdue run doesn't allow for that at all. Right. So, so he's, he's been practicing for four years. No, actually, he's a pretty good free throw shooter, and that's a good sign. Guys, if your big man can shoot free throws, that is a good sign. And that and what I think is that Zach Eady has consistently got better every single year. He made leaps and bounds when he was at Purdue So because he started playing basketball kind of late. So to me, he actually has... So even more to grow. Maybe not like body wise, but skill wise, he has a lot to grow into. Do you think he could at least be as good as Chris Kamen from back in the day? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that his foot speed showed to be a little bit better and his shooting turned out to be a little bit better. And I think that overall, the value is this. I don't know if he's going to be an NBA star, but I think he's going to be solid in the NBA because he's going to be able to draw so much attention because now a lot of like 
teams play small ball. So if you got a 6'10 or 6'9 center and Zach Eady checks in, he's 7'3, he's going to get some buckets on the 6'9 guy, right? right? Regardless who it is. So the defense is going to have to suck in and uh, double team in and help defense, which means that he can kick the ball out to a shooter. So therefore, he has a lot of value in that. Even in not him scoring, I'm saying he has a lot lot of value in getting other people a shot. I think that if Zach Eady dedicates to training his body and his mind and getting his like court mapping IQ way up there, he's going to be as effective at least as Zubak and definitely has a higher ceiling than Boban Marjanovic. Oh yeah. Boban's been in the league for seven years. Yeah. I think he's better. He's way more skilled than Boban already. So I think David overall to wrap up predictions for Zach Eady, what do you think, man? I think he's probably got at least a 10 year NBA career. Okay. What do you think he averages his rookie year? (sighs) Averages his rookie year. Realistically, something more like maybe eight and eight. Okay, eight and eight. I was going to say he even averages maybe 10 and seven and maybe like two blocks. And him and John Morant, even though he'll probably be coming off the bench, I don't know if he's going to start. I well, because they lost Steven Adams, I think. So. Oh, interesting. No, so I think he might start depending on... Dude, I was watching uh, the Grizzlies organization and even like Ja, they're pretty high on Zach Eady. Like they're pretty happy about it. Because they found a lot of undervalued players in the past. Desmond Baines was undervalued. Valanchunas was kind of undervalued. Mm. People didn't see the value. I mean, Steven Adams was kind of fairly valued. but okay. like, So basically, they think they got one. All but right. moving on, Andrew, to somebody that people do compare to Boban Marjanovic a lot. Zhang Ziyu from China, U17, Andrew. Dude, she's 7'3". She's young. She's not even... What is she, 17 years old or 16? 17, 17. Dude, this girl is 7'3". And she is basically dominating her age bracket. Now, we're going to play some highlights here at the bottom of uh, her in the uh, under... I think for women, it was under 18 World Cup. Asia Asia Championship. What? No, World... uh, FIBA World Cup. Yeah. What? Whatever. Anyways, they played Australia. They did lose Australia in the finals, but... She did have 40. She's been averaging crazy. Obviously, she's huge, right? But she has a good touch. David, what do you think are her pros and cons right now? Obviously, a lot of people kind of doubt, oh, well, she's too slow for the right. college for D1 girls and the WNBA. Oh, that's crazy to think she's not going to play D1 women's because D1 women's is like once you get outside of like UConn and Tennessee and like LSU, the programs take a huge drop off. She is definitely a D1. I'm not saying talent. she's going to start at center for UConn though. Yeah, right. like, you know, like I said, there's a pretty big variance there. I would say that, uh, man... She does remind me of Boban. Yeah, but like, I would even say even better in a way. But I'm saying Boban and maybe in Europe, if Boban didn't come to the NBA, because sure. the reason why Boban's not very dominant is because he's playing in the NBA versus like if he was playing in a different league. A right, lower league. right, right. I mean, I think it clearly shows she has a good touch. I don't know about her passing. Like the highlights don't really show her passing and kickouts. Um, she could work on it. She could work on it. I don't think it's bad, but it's not good. Obviously, she's gigantic, and I think if IQ wise and she improves the foot speed, I mean, she's still growing, and I think she has potential. I mean, I definitely think I think she's gonna be in the WNBA at some point. I'm like not, they'll give her a chance, right? Yeah, I'm not saying she's gonna dominate the WNBA. I do think that women in the WNBA are quite quicker than her right now but i think she's gonna be in the wm dude you're seven three you have a good touch you know how to play the game of basketball why wouldn't you get a shot yeah i think it's all gonna go down to her love of the game and here's her crying after they lost to australia so she clearly she cares right you know what i mean dude um, i mean she got to get her body right she got to train in the u.s change them things up I mean, about her dude, diet and just stuff to like that. put it in perspective even if she was a seven foot three man at 17 there's a lot of people who would might give her a chance on a D1 college basketball team. Right. Just being that tall and being able to know how to play basketball. Yeah. What do they got her wearing? Kobe's? Because, man, know. they got to get some for some centers. Um, but, yeah, I mean, obviously, she went super viral on the internet recently. Right. And, yeah, so, Andrew, you're predicting at least WNBA shot. Oh, yeah. The, by yeah. the way, there was there's a Chinese girl on the Sparks right now, and even back when the WNBA started, there was this girl called Lo Sha who was on the WNBA Sparks. Too. Yeah, how, how tall is a Han... Han she, uh, you talking Han about the girl on the Sparks right now? Yeah, Han Zhu, right? What's her name? Yeah. yeah oh, Han no, Zhu. no, you're talking about the, the she was Chinese on the girl that's on the Liberty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How I tall forgot. Is I don't know. I think she's, she's like 6'10", I think. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, she couldn't be at least on that level. Right, right, right. 
like we said, she has a long time. It depends on how committed they are and how her handlers and the apparatus, apparatus around her. Like, they got to get her the right coaching, though, for sure. Get some protein and stuff like that. Okay, correction. Han Shu on the Liberty is 6'11". Anyways, okay. continue. Um, moving on, Andrew. The U-17 Chinese team just beat France. Obviously, they got crushed by the U.S., but... Uh, for them to beat France is a pretty big deal. Because yeah, so France is considered an international basketball powerhouse. And China, for the last 20 years, has sucked. Yeah, so for the young men's team to be succeeding this much and beating France, considering that the France senior team kills the Chinese men's senior team, it kind of goes to show you that the young Chinese guards are getting better. That the Chinese trained... Uh, players, whether they get training overseas in America or not, they're just getting better. The next generation of Team China is going to be better than the previous one. Right, you, sure. Andrew, you're talking about Bo Yuan Zhang. He's a player that some people think could go to the NBA. Yep. There's a 7-1 guy called Sinan Huan who plays very similar to Chet Holmgren. He's got a twin brother. Uh, Fan Bo Zeng, I don't know. Realistically, he's more like a G League guy, but probably be more overseas. Mm -hmm. Hanson Yang, probably also overseas more realistically than NBA. But yeah, Andrew, China basketball has been considered in a 15, 20 year lull since Yao Ming, Yi Jianlian. Well, Andrew, who else? They have Menge Batir. They had all the, a bunch of Chinese players right, in the right, NBA right. at one point. Sun Yue won a championship with the Lakers, even though he wasn't on the playoff uh, roster. I like to follow Chinese baller vision on Instagram. They really cover like Chinese basketball a lot. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's going to be interesting to see. Obviously China has a lot of people. They definitely have the talent pool, but for some reason, bro, I'm not in, you know, I'm trying the, the training, the training and the mm. mindset just was not there for a long time. And not only that, the selection of the players, because yeah. you have all the players that love basketball, playing street ball and doing uh Kings of the underdogs, like one-on-ones, but they're not really working on their body in any sort of like pro system. Yeah. And they're not understanding like the play action. Yeah. And I'm not going to underrate the amount of outside training that the Chinese guys are getting. Like, I know a lot of Chinese, uh, young Chinese teenagers that are training in America with, like, J-Law and some of the famous basketball the pro trainers NBA out trainers, here. Right? Yeah, the pro-NBA trainers. They're getting American pro-level top-tier training for years, you know, yeah. at least in the summertime. I, so, I think the biggest struggle is going to be getting the high-tier five-on-five reps. Mm. You know what I mean? Seeing enough reps, just, like, things that happen, fast break, slow, you know, half court. Um... Andrew, you're going to see a lot more from Asia in general, D1 tier basketball players, specifically from Japan, Korea, Philippines, and China. They're importing a lot more U.S. coaches to Asia, but also having the players, like you said, train in America in the summers. Oh, man. Yeah. I mean, I think I'm pretty, I'm pretty looking forward to the Japanese team. You know, uh, they train very differently. Like they train a lot of th like weave drills without dribbling and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Um. Do you think that you are the most bullish on Japan? You're saying... It of the Asian teams, yes. I think the Japan team is overall the best. They're going to have Hachimura and Watanabe. Even though Utah opted to leave the NBA to go be a star, I think he was tired of getting... Yeah, traded. Utah retired from the NBA. Utah. Watanabe, I, I, I hope yeah. he comes back. I hope he comes back. I, I doubt it. I think he's just going to focus on Japan, in my opinion, and raising his family. But anyways, um, yeah, I think the Japan team of the Asia teams is overall going to be the strongest team, it seems like. Right. Uh, Andrew, let's talk about Jalen winning a championship with his brother in the P-plus league in Taiwan. Yeah, I mean, Jeremy Lin, two-time basketball champion, one in the NBA, one in Taiwan. Um, I mean, I think it's cool to see Jalen still playing basketball. Uh even though, like, I think a lot of people assume that when he goes to Taiwan, he all of a sudden is going to dominate and average, like, 30 points a game. That's not necessarily the situation, you know. But he's still, he's basically still star one and two punch right there on that team, um, getting it done. And I think that's cool that, you know, he's still enjoying playing basketball and doing it for his motherland country, you know. So that's cool. Right, right, right. He's kind of like the Chauncey Billups on the Pistons championship team. Like, that role versus, like, trying to, like, run every rep through him. Right, right, like, right. Yeah. Um, Real quick, Andrew, we got a shout-out to the CCYAA game in Toronto coming up. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You guys, Toronto, this is the biggest basketball game in all of Toronto this year. Not to downplay the Toronto Raptors. But, uh, yeah, uh, there's actually a lot of ex-former NBA players that are going to be playing in it. Jason Williams, I think, is supposed to be there. Matt Bonner is supposed to be there. Simu Liu, Jeremy Lin. Well, We're Simu and Jeremy's there. game. Yeah. Say so, hey, shout-out to them. Get tickets right here. 
Um, Andrew, real quick, just to let people know, we still are very much into basketball sneakers. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, let's just go through some of my favorites real quick. Andrew, the Jordan 38 mid and the Jordan 38 low. I think that these shoes are super underrated. Mm. Like these are excellent shoes, but I think here's the problem, Andrew. There's some durability issues with the outsole. Why? That's why, well, the, the sole kind of comes detached from the shoe. Well, what, what do you like about them? I just think that this is the perfect blend of having a ton of zoom, a ton of support, but still a lot of four. It's like a, to me, a 8.75 on everything, but it's not a 10 out of 10 on anything. So I think that that's why this would be like perfect for literally any medium to heavy player. Mm -hmm. Moving on, Andrew. The KD-17, I think this shoe is underrated. I think that this is almost like the new version of the, the Hyper Dunk line where this is just good for anybody, but maybe a little skinnier than the Jordan 38. Okay. Like, you know what I mean? KD is very skinny. Of course, Chet Holmgren wears these as well. But um, shoes that I didn't uh, like this year that I didn't love, GT Hustle 2, which is the Wembenyama shoe. I liked it, but the traction wasn't good enough. I didn't get to try the New Balance Fresh Foam BBV2 or the Kawhi 4. The Jordan 39 is coming out next month. Shoes that I didn't like was the GT uh, Jump 2, I thought I was going to really like it because it was for big men and they have double stack zoom in the front, but just the forefoot was way too narrow. Oh, Andrew, I think the most overrated shoe this year was the AE1. Oh, the Ant Edwards. Zero cushioning in the front. Like, I'm talking about none. It, like, if you're a heavy dude, you're going to get nothing. A lot of people bought them, though. Well, I think it's a great looking shoe. It's cheap. It's got good right. traction. Um, but real quick, I wanted to talk about a shoe that a lot of people didn't like that I like is the Jordan 37. I have like four pairs of these. Wow. And they're not like, they're, they, like, like I said, there's shoes like the Jordan 38 here that are like 8.5 out of everything, like in like seven different categories. This shoe is like 10 out of 10 on bounce, but like seven out of 10 on traction. Okay. But, but when I want a bouncy shoe, that's the shoe that I go to. Okay. And then of course, uh, like I said, I think there's a difference between half court shoes and full court shoes. You're, my favorite half court shoe is still the Kyrie Infinity but it's different when you need to run and sprint. Yeah. All right. So for me, uh, basketball shoes that I really like right now, GT Cut 3. I think that this is a good shoe overall. Makes you feel fast. Very light. Great cushioning. Um, side to side, there's a slight slippage foot moving around, which I really don't like. But overall, it's great for full court sprinting. Now, the reason why I say full court versus half court is because in the half court, I really like these, the Asics Nova Surge. And uh, from Japan. From Japan. Yeah, I know a lot of people. David, you had to have a friend from Japan pick these up. So uh, based off volleyball shoes, but since volleyball and basketball shoes, at least side-to-side -side movements are pretty similar. And also height-wise, people like to leap vertically, go side-to-side. -side. It's similar build, but I really like this shoe because... It really makes you lean on your toes. Like, as you can see, the curvature here mm -hmm. at the bottom, the heel-to-toe ratio push you up. The cushioning is okay, but overall, the stability side-to-side -side is locked down. I think a lot of Asians would like the Asics. But like you said, if you, if you need to run and sprint, you mm -hmm. want a shoe that gives you more energy yeah. return. One shoe that didn't fully work for me that worked for a lot of other people, and I know our friend Nelson Chan loves it, is the LeBron uh, Next Gen. And right, sort of based off the LeBron 20. Yeah, uh, this upper was a little bit stiff for me, and since I have small ankles, this upper uh, area of where the uh, lace loops are is really hard, and it kind of dug into my ankle right here. Why do you think wear testers gave a shoe of the year for 2023? I think it just, it unfortunately just didn't fit my foot. Unfortunately, hit my foot wrong, and that's all it takes, guys, because the upper is kind of stiff around here, and you can feel, look at this part right here. What, what did you think about the LeBron 21? Because I know you had a couple pairs of the LeBron 20. What did you think of the 21? I had the LeBron 21. I, I ended up getting rid of them, but they were pretty good. They had really good cushioning, but I thought... Something about, man, when they build shoes and they have, like, this super... They try to make it, like, luxurious on the inside of the shoe in, like, nylon satin-like, but it's slippery. I don't understand that. Like, my foot slipped around because the inside was so plush and silky. Mm. So it was comfortable to put on, but slid around a little bit too Andrew, much. you could have pulled Apollo Bancaro and wore your socks inside out. That's what he does to get the grip on the inside of the Maybe. shoe. Maybe. Sure. Um, but yeah, obviously, Andrew, one shoe you did not like was the Luka 2, right? Yeah, I had the Luka 2s. They were okay, good stability, but kind of stiff overall. Right. Uh, you didn't get a try for narrow footers, weight of weight 11 yet, big 3 5.0 quick pro, Sabrina 2, and the Puma Nitro Pro. 
So oh, Sabrina twos, but women's shoes generally have a higher arch and that's too high for me. Right. Um, just some quick tips real quick, guys, because we're combining all the basketball topics together. Wear basketball elite socks, whether they're Nike or not, usually going to fill out your shoe, give you better grip. Uh, there is grip spray for your outsoles on indoor. There's hand grip spray if you got slippery hands, sweaty hands. And then there is a uh, grip tape for the outsole of your shoes get really dusty. Real quick, Andrew, what's your take on Caitlin Clark? She just made the all-star oh team. Oh, my gosh. You know, people were asking us to make a video about this controversy for the last month. Bro, I don't even really want to talk about the drama between, like, people hating on Caitlin Clark. But I will tell you this, man. I was a Caitlin Clark believer. And I know somebody in this room was a doubter. Do you still doubt them? Doubter? David? I... You what? still doubt Caitlin Clark? Do you look at I, what she's doing? All right. I think the high points are still there, but I think that obviously she has struggled with some aspects of the pro game transition. But obviously she's still doing, she's doing the Trey Young thing. She's doing what she was kind of expected to do, to be honest. Like, right. yes, she's getting a lot of turnovers. That I understand. And that is always something you can work on. Right, you Steph can play Curry, the teammates too. Steph Curry got used to get a lot of turnovers and Trey Young, obviously high turnover rate. But obviously her change in the game hitting these crazy shots, drawing all this attention to the WNBA. Generational talent. Right. All-star voting, Andrew, went from 100K max for the lead top vote getter to 700K in one year. Bro, guys who don't, we, I don't, like, when did we, I ever really talk about the WNBA amongst a large group of friends, minus a couple highlights. Like, people are watching Caitlin Clark highlights. Not to mention that there's not other great players, okay? Uh, but... I will say, yeah, Caitlin, she's she's the she got the eyeballs, man. Right. I would compare Angel Reese honestly to like Zach Randolph because it's not a very skillful or good looking game. Well, she I, gets it done. She gets the numbers. Yeah, I don't want to say it's not skillful. I just want to say it's not graceful. It's not yeah, a graceful yeah, yeah. game. I would say like you know who somebody I I got to find out about their game now is Jewel Lloyd from the uh, Storm. Like, she actually plays, like she got a little Fred Van Fleet game. Yeah, actually, that even that girl Chennedy who was who everybody said was hating on Caitlin Clark, she kind of good at, she, she got she moves some moves. Like moves like a dude. She and moves like a dude. And moves like a dude in a good way is what we're saying, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I do think that, you know, she's going to need to de de develop some things against the physicality, and I think she'll end up like a hybrid between Steph and Trey, but more of a winner than Trey Young, because obviously, but, but her moves to me look more like Trey than like Steph's actually, but obviously Trey and Steph. What do you think about Bronny, Andrew? He just went 55 over to the Lakers. Some people claiming nepotism. Obviously, everybody knows it's nepotism, but people are still rooting for him. And at the, at the end of the day, I guess it just goes to show you the NBA is an entertainment product. Yeah, the NBA is an entertainment product. I mean, I think that there is always nepotism in sports, but this is the first, because it's player for player nepotism, that's when it seems like it's super obvious because LeBron is the most powerful player in the league and his son is now in the league and on the same team. I think it's a great story. Listen, I know some people are mad because they're like, oh, well, no one wants to come to the Lakers now. I'm like, it didn't prevent people from coming to the Lakers, guys. Like, listen, as a LeBron fan, I'm just going to take the next two years and be like, hey, LeBron and Bronny on the same team, that's pretty interesting to see. Whether the Lakers win another championship, which they're probably not in the next two years, um, they'll maybe go to the playoffs. Maybe Bronny... I think Bronny actually will improve a lot better than people think, even though for sure him getting drafted was nepotistic. For sure. Like, he is not getting drafted. If he had to be LeBron's son to get drafted 55, that means without being LeBron's son, he's not getting drafted at all. He's going undrafted, for sure. Well, he's got, he'll probably get signed to a G League contract and have to work his way up yeah. and perform in the G, to be honest. I would think, I would say this, I've been watching a lot of Davion Mitchell clips because a lot of people could say that Bronny is a poor man's Davion mm -hmm. Mitchell. I mean, Davion Mitchell, man, he's really good, man. I was just watch this clip of him dunking on everybody. Great job. Stay in the gym and keep at it. Keep chopping wood. Oh, he took some souls. Oh, he took some bodies. And on Joe Ingles, but my goodness, to elevate like that, throw it down, and my favorite part of the whole thing. Do we think that Bronny is going to be at any point better than Davion Mitchell is right now? Nah. I'm just saying, but Davion Mitchell, I, you could also make an argument that if it wasn't for his height, his usage rate would be way higher. Listen, all I'm saying is, guys, you guys don't know how legendary this would be 
if LeBron throws an alley-oop to Bronny or vice versa. That is going to be an all-time NBA sentimental highlight because you may never see, and I say never even given in the next... In the next 30 years, I don't think you will see another father-son duo play on the same NBA team at the same time. I don't think so. Do you think that all the kids in the NBA are going to have an NBA father now? It seems like it. Like, if you look at the next class, the Boozer kids are coming up. Um, I'll say this, man, about basketball. I just loved basketball my whole life, and I felt like it taught me a lot about life. And even nowadays, I guess the biggest transition I've been looking into, Andrew, is watching more like uh, thinking basketball or awful coaching to like get more of like the coaching IQ. But uh, I just think that basketball and life have a lot to do with each other, sport and life do, but you can only see the comparisons once you understand life at above a six out of 10 level and you understand that sport at a six or a seven out of 10 level and up. That's when you can really start to like draw from each other and use it to understand everything. Mm. Anyway, guys, let us know what you guys think about our basketball hot takes in the comment section below. What shoes are you wearing right now? I mean, what do you think about Zach ED? What do you think about Zhang Ziyu? What do you think about Caitlin Clark? What do you think about Bronny James? Guys, let us know. Uh, this was a long one, but hopefully it was a good one. Until next time, we the Hop Hop Boys. We out. Peace. Peace.